amen. In the way of introduction, we all grow up into doubters. Gen sorry, uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 15, verses 1, and we'll read from there. So my wife is looking at me go, Huh? Oh, you offered me the Bible, sorry. Yeah, as you can see, I'm, I'm struggling with my eyes. <laughs> so, anyway, God's going to help us. We, we grow up as doubters. You know, again, you know, when we first, um, again, I'm, I'm making the assumption just on my own sort of observations that as, you know, young kids, um, they do trust. But, but very quickly or early, somewhere along the line, they begin to realize the letdown. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, and so we start to develop not trusting. Many of us have been promised to have them been broken. Okay, he's never been promised something. Amen. There are some people who are sitting on this side, amen, who are not sitting on that side because you know what? You said you promised me you'd give me my £10 back. <laughs> Promises we know can oftentimes, if not all the time, damage relationships depending on the severity or the importance of that promise. It erodes trust. And we understand that trust is the foundation for all relationships. Because without that church, we can't function. You know, our relationships, I mean, let's think about our relationship with the government. They spent most of their time trying to say, listen, you can trust us. I know you couldn't trust that lot and the other lot and the other lot. And even us when we were in power many years ago, you couldn't trust us, but you can trust us now. <laughs> it, it's, it's, I don't know, man. We, we understand that, that a lot of people in government don't stick to their word. We heard that in, even in this in election, to try and get out of it, so we can't promise you, right? Because they know we have church leaders, spouses, family members, parents. And what can happen is that, you know, when someone, a man uh, is engaging with you and they say the words, I promise, oftentimes, if you're like me, there's a bit of a side eye. You know, but I start quenching, like, Lips start pout, like, you know, like, somehow the fact that you are promising gives me an indication there's something not quite right here. That's how far we've gone with it. <laughs> Our biggest problem is trusting. And oftentimes, to be honest with you, this is one of the biggest things that, that we have to try and deal with in life itself. Like, like, it's a lifetime achievement almost to get to that place where I want to learn to trust. And the thing is, coming to God, this is one of the biggest hindrance, or hindrances that, 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 that we could face. Because much of God's conversation, if you was to kind of just tally up as you read the scriptures, as you read in the Bible, you begin to just... Most of what God is saying, most of his interaction with people is really saying... Do you trust me? You know, if we pull it in a nutshell, are you going to believe me? I mean, think about Nathan just right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I mean, he hasn't even really kind of got going. And, you know, the disciples um, recognize that this could be the Messiah. And Nathaniel is like a skeptic. And he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, it's too good to be true. I mean, anyone coming out of there, surely there's got to be something kind of funny. You know, seeing the miracles, as I mentioned this morning, the disciples are witnessing Jesus over and over again. This is like very early, first, I mean, you had three years with him, remember that, right? I don't know what part of the year this was, you know, 
first six months, eight months, a year, who knows? But they'd seen a lot. And Jesus, amen, is on the boat, sleeping, and they make the assumption, amen, as a storm is coming, that he doesn't care. And Jesus has to say to them, where is your faith? You know, we're going to discuss it in a minute, because the reason why he says it in that way, where is it? Because it, it's going to be somewhere, okay? Philip, and I've given a couple of examples here just to kind of set us up because Philip, Jesus, amen, knows he's got to die. He's on his way to uh, the cross, uh, so to speak, uh, not too far from this. And Jesus is trying to comfort them. And Philip kind of just pops up and he says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And if, Jesus, I know what you're saying, but I don't know if you can just kind of, you know, Shows Jesus kind of, there's almost like a sounding of frustration because have I not been with you all this time? And you still don't know. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, the list kind of goes on. Uh, the road to Aramaeus, amen. None of them did believe. Then Jesus had to end up saying, you are foolish and slow. Uh, to realize what is true, you should have believed. And I know that maybe I've given the impression that there's a frustration. And, and there, there probably is a, uh, some kind of frustration from God. Uh, but we've got to first understand, because in our text, as we begin to read, you know, we're going to see, amen, um, how God deals with our lack of faith. Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to read in verses 1. And the Bible says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Ab or Abram in, the vi to <clears throat> in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, will you give me, seeing I go childless, and that the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but the one will come, but, sorry, but, uh, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look, now towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. He believed in the Lord and he, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Verse 7, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord, this is the bit. Lord. Lord God, again, if, if you're going to do some study, study that, you know, he, he, he's saying almighty God, right? So he knows, you know, he, today we're talking about more of a fatherly, you know, he's, he's, you know, Lord God, how shall I know that I would inherit it? They're cheeky. Verses nine, and he said to him, bring me a three-year-old, Heather, a three-year-old uh, female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought them all to. Then he brought all the, the all all these to him, and and cut them into into two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down of the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Verse of now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Ab Abram, and behold, a horror and a great darkness fell upon him. Then he, then he said to Abram, uh, "Know certainly that your descendants will will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict, and they will afflict them for four hundred years." 
and also the nations whom they serve I will judge after and they shall come out with great possession. Let's go down to verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the two pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants, I have given you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of, of the river of Euphrates. I'll stop there. And that's God's word. Amen. Not only can God get slightly frustrated, but the truth of the matter is, amen, we can get frustrated with God. Let's be honest. You're under the head. <laughs> Don't worry, you won't get struck down. He is known as the father of faith. When everyone, especially like Paul and the rest of the apostles, amen, when it calculated, when they're, when they're looking at all that, amen, that Abraham had achieved, the, amen, their, 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 their closing statement was, he is our father of faith. And here it shows that this father of faith, amen, is actually struggling. This father of faith, amen, really reminds, amen, me of me and you. Because the fact that you're even here on a Sunday evening when England is playing in a minute. <laughs> it just, it, it just, you know, but although we're here and we have come a long way, we've made some decisions, right? We, you know, we've been born again for some time. But oftentimes, we, 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 you know, <clears throat> we, we've got to realize that sometimes, like Abraham, amen, we're going to struggle with some things that God is trying to do through us and, and, and for us. Many times, amen, God uh, begins to show up because the Bible says that at this point in time, uh, that he was afraid. Verses 1 says, right from the, the get-go, amen, uh, um, do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield, your very great reward. And, and the issue is, one of the things we have to look at, amen, why was he afraid? The Bible says after these things, and let me give you a little bit of background here. His own idiotic nephew, Lot, who, amen, decides to kind of go and do his own thing. He's seeing his uncle being blessed. He thought, you know what, uh, I can be blessed. You know the story? He looks at the plains of Jordan. He sees the glory. And he thinks, you know what, I'm going to, he heads down there and he lives around. You know, he gets it all wrong. And in the end, you know, <clears throat> every so often, you know, these, these, these kings begin to rally together and, you know, fight the other tribes and other things. Amen. They see Lot. And they take Lot, his family, and all his stuff. And the Bible says that Abraham finds out about this, uh, and he understands he can't just leave it, that he's got to go out and rescue his own nephew, his family. So he gathers, amen, what he can, this very small army, but God is with him, uh, and he goes down there, and he, he defeats the enemy. He gets back Lot and all the bits and pieces, amen. Uh, but he understands uh, that, you know what, uh, revenge is at hand. He knows, amen, that at some point, uh, uh, some of these kings are going to come, amen, uh, and think, you know what, what, you think you can just come in and take my, and come and get him? And this is why he's afraid. But you see, <clears throat> that he's afraid on one level, amen, uh, but what, what happens is, is that... <clears throat> This whole episode reminds him of a deeper fear that he's got. Because as Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus, as God, amen, begins to uh, explain to him, listen, do not fear. Abraham begins to reveal, amen, uh, the deeper issue. Because he says, listen, Lord, you said you're going to give me a child. And the only one that's in my household right now is Eliezer, amen. And he's, he's not really my actual son. You know, God confirms to him, um, listen, not this one, amen, but I'm going to give you one from your own body.
God started to show him the stars. In other words, what he's saying, listen, uh, you know, what I'm going to do in your life, you know, how I've created the stars, how they are, the, the multitude of universes out there, amen, uh, planets, uh, stars, whatever it may be, amen, uh, it's the same thing I'm going to do in your family. I mean, think about what he's saying. He, you know, you know, it's nighttime. Some of you have been out on um boot camp and sometimes we're out, amen, uh, in, in where there's no, no pollution. You can actually see the sky. You can see the stars. And he says, come out here. Let's finish it. Let me show you, amen. And he looks, and um, we know, amen, that, that at that point, uh, uh, Abraham, amen, he said, listen, Lord, I, I believe you. I, I believe you. God said, you know, God then turns around and he says, I credit this to you as, as righteousness. Uh, it's a whole nother sermon. But as God is doing this, clearly, amen, something's still at work in his heart because this deepens the agony. Because God, you know, he keeps showing me. God, you keep speaking to me about. I see the stars and I believe you. I, I, but, but, but the problem is, Lord, I, I'm, I'm looking at Sarah at the same time. You know, she's old and past childbearing. I see the stars, God, <laughs> but I see my wife. God, I see the land, uh, and I believe you, uh, but the truth of the matter is, Lord, I'm still homeless. I'm seeing all the Amorites and the Parasites and all the ites that are out there, amen. Uh, I, I get what you're saying, God. I'm seeing it, uh, and then the truth of the matter is, amen, you could feel the tension in, in, in Abraham's heart, uh, because this magnificent promise uh, seemed, amen, to be lost in Abraham. But one of the beautiful things is that God doesn't condemn him, rather calls on him. Rather, amen, embraces him and begins to minister to him. Let, you know, where does this come from? Let, let me just pause there just for a moment. I've got a few minutes. Because, you know, Genesis 11, would, would, you know, it tells us what, what's happening. Genesis 11, right, is a whole myriad of, 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 of basically explaining that nobody wanted to serve the true and living God. Everyone was going their own way. You would read that they went to the east and they went to the east. In other words, they was moving away from the Eden, the garden. We don't want any of that. We hear what God has said, go forth and multiply. But you know what, what we're going to do? We're going to deliberately, amen, gather together and build here. We're going to make our own city. We're going to make our own religion. And he actually says, we're going to make, what did they say? We're going to make a name for ourselves. And God, seeing this amen, literally goes out and he finds Abraham in contrast and says to him, listen, I want you, Abraham, to get out of your country. He says, you know what? I want you to leave your father's house Amen, to a land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I'll make your name great. In, in, in direct contrast to what the world was doing. And so God calls upon him. And one of the most beautiful things, amen, is that <clears throat> Abraham leaves his country. Based on God's word, Abraham leaves, amen, his people, his family, amen, and, um, uh, and, and he goes, uh, and, and, and Hebrews 11 even says, um, uh, 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 Hebrews 11, 8 says, by faith, Abraham obeyed God, and when even though he did not know where he was going, that's faith. I don't know where Amen. We can surmise and, and, and summarize this whole sort of episode because God is saying, I'm going to send you out. And Abraham says, where? God says, just walk with me. I'll tell you later. I'm going to give you a land. And Abraham says, when? 
Walk with me and I'll tell you later. I want to give you a nation, amen, a people. And Abraham clearly, he obviously, he says, how? We're old. God says, walk with me and I'll tell you later. And what I want to say here first is that the truth is much of Christianity, amen, is, if not all, really is walk by faith and not by sight. But you see, the problem is that most of the time, amen, this sounds, amen, like, you know, you know when you're going through something, and they go, are you believing God? And you want to trip your teeth. Are you trusting God? And you're like, how much do you really believe in? Walk by faith. And sometimes they can almost seem as though, amen, it's like hush up and keep it moving. Just trust God. And these terms, amen, could, you know, especially in the moment, amen, where things are really difficult and hard, amen, it could just sound quite hollow. God is saying, walk with me. And Abraham is saying, listen, I've been walking. I have been walking. And basically what happens is Abraham says, hold up one second. Just, we're going to pause for a minute. Because God, I'm, I'm going to carry on walking, but man, I, I, I need something more. You know, God in everything... <clears throat> Everything, God, you've asked me to do, I've done. You've got to read between the lines here. I passed. You know, when it's time, <clears throat> you know, despite the circumstances, I've walked with you. Despite the disappointments, Lord, I've walked with you. God, you know, man, when I'm looking at my wife and, 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 and the rest of it, God... Despite, amen, the contradictions, God, we've been walking. Lord, I get it. But God, Lord, what I'm asking, how do I know what you're saying to me? Because he's bringing his doubts to God. He is frustrated, but he's frustrated, as, uh, as I was trying to point out this morning, amen, it, it, you know, these frustrations are brought before God. That we can be totally honest. That you can, amen, take the Bible and flick through the promises and say, Lord, this ain't happening. I don't know why, Lord, but that ain't happening. This is what Abraham's doing, amen. Uh, he's, 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 he's pointing out, amen, God, you said some stuff, but I need to know before he's God, amen, and he, in, in doing so, we learn a few things, and we're, we're going to look at those, and we're going to close. See, doubts don't have to mean the end of our faith. But as we're going to see in our text, amen, it's, it can, it's, it's usually, amen, for those who have a right heart about their doubts, amen, uh, it's tra transformative. It can transform us, uh, amen. Thomas, uh, we know, really struggled. The disciples, amen, uh, had seen Jesus. Uh, the disciples come to Thomas. Uh, they explained to him, we have seen him. We've touched him. We, we've spoken to him. He's alive. Uh, Thomas says, listen, I, I mean, how can you do that, Thomas? The disciples that you walked with, they're telling you, unless I see the, the prince, it's not like it's I see him. I want to touch the, put my fingers in the print and on his side. I mean, he's going for it. The Bible tells us that eight days go by and they eventually they, they are able to convince him, come, he will turn up somewhere, somehow. Jesus does him and he walks in. Thomas, here I am. 
touch. And it was transformative because the, the revelation that he got, the other side was not yet. They were still, he says, Lord, my God. God is actually saying, I understand that my word is not enough. I know he is, oh, Pastor, what are you saying? I know that my word is not enough, amen. Uh, we have contradictions from, <clears throat> amen. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. You, you, excuse me, your realities and your circumstances. But I understand you need more. Let's look at what he does. The Bible says, amen. He makes a covenant with him. And if you have your Bibles, uh, maybe it might be there. But Hebrews chapter six is in direct um, correlation with Genesis 15. Because in, in Hebrews 6, <clears throat> verses, um, I, I believe it's 17, it says, for men indeed swear by the greater, I think I, I missed the verse there, but don't worry. Uh, for men indeed swear by the greater an oath for uh, confirmation is, uh, is for them an end of all dispute. The Bible says, thus God determining to show a more abundantly to his ears of a promise the immutability of his counsel. He says, confirmed it with an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled the, 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 uh, fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, here it is. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. See, what this is talking about, church, is that <clears throat> God wants us to anchor our faith to something that is strong. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, amen, uh, you know, like I said this morning, our roots could be elsewhere other than the, the living water, right? Or the, the, the water by the, right? Our anchors could be anchored on other things. Uh, you know, when I, <clears throat> I was telling a story that when I went um, to Grenada, we was on a boat, and I'm telling you, you know, when, when at the time we had fun, but when I'm looking back on it, I'm like, man, we could have dead. Because there was this fisherman, he said, just jump, on, just jump on, no life jacket. And I'm telling you, I, 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 as, as God is my witness, man, I'm telling you, I must have looked back and I see no land, but I saw water. It was like a wall. And this boat was going down and up. <laughs> Right? We're screaming happily, but right? You know, and we went so far out that we couldn't really see any land anymore. Which way is home? <laughs> and I couldn't see no anchor. So it, my mind started racing, but if we you get the picture, right? The point I'm saying is that having an anchor keeps you where you need to be. And the thing is, when you have an anchor in, it's no good putting your anchor just in the water. <laughs> but, amen, the rope has to be long enough to go deep enough, amen, um, to be able to go to the bedrock, uh, grab onto something, amen, and it holds you. And so what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, listen, the word of God, the promise of God is like an anchor for the soul. The truth is, church, amen, uh, oftentimes uh, our anchor, amen, uh, is on our jobs. The anchor is attached to our looks, I said this morning, our talent, our money, amen, our spouses, even. But as I was saying in the beginning, promises are made, but we can get let down. You know, Romans Romans uh, uh, 8.20 says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willing but because 
of him who subjected it in hope. Now, let, let me just kind of uh, uh, expound on that. What, what that's really saying is that God created earth and all that's in it with, with, with like a vainness to it. And, and the reason why he, he does that is because, I don't know if you've seen, you know, you've seen movie stars, right, who win Oscars. And they get the Oscar and they realize, is this it? I've been working all my life climbing up this thing. And this is it. I mean, today, I mean, the truth of the matter, we're going to win the World Cup, hopefully, right? Everyone's going to, but, but at the end, of, it's just the, there's a, it doesn't satisfy. We've got to win again. <laughs> it's coming home again, again. <laughs> you know, it, it won't. <laughs> Another 60 something years. Because he understands that if we anchor to anything in this world, amen, we won't anchor on him. He's deliberately. How many put nice cars and then someone comes with a, a nicer car? And you was happy with your car. And so, oh, what? It, this, this is our heart, I mean, We just want more and more and more. And God's deliberately put that because the, the idea is that the hope that you realize there's nothing in this world, amen, that you can anchor your life to. Because anything, amen, that's not God is just water. This is why the Bible says, Jesus says, amen, heaven and earth will pass away. This is Matthew, amen, chapter 24. He speaks about the end times. Everything is going to end. Everything is going to, and then he says, but the one thing that's not going to end, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And the question is what we're anchoring on. God is saying, I know you've been believing, but this whole thing, I'm not expecting you, man, to have a belief that's empty, that's hollow or shallow, amen. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm going to give you something, amen, to hold on to. He says, let's go shopping. And let me close with this. Because he goes, amen, and he says, all right, verse 8, how would I know? Verse 9, he said, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old ram, and, and the whole Tesco shopping list there, all right? And the whole idea was that because Abraham knew exactly what was going to happen here, he knew this was custom. God is going to make a covenant. And the whole idea of every covenant, amen, uh, you know, when we promise something, if someone, you know, we get married, and we see it, amen, in most, some of us who've been married for a while, we're cynical sometimes, isn't it? Because they're all lovey-dovey, the eyes, you know, you know, you know, guys can't wait, she comes down, she, you know, you know, I love you, you love me, and, uh, you know, sickness and health, all these words, you know, you know, but the truth of the matter is, how do I know, that's what we're saying, that what we say to each other, how do I know? Straight after, we go to do what? To sign. I am signing that I'm going to love you to the end. Right? But the truth is that in today's world, there's not much consequence for that. But in these days, when they make covenants, amen, there's always a consequence. And they said, we're going to dramatize it. That's what, basically what it was. We're going to dramatize it. So they will cut these animals and part them. I mean, it was horrible. It was a bloody uh, situation, a bloody mess, so to speak. Uh, and what would happen is, amen, the two parties uh, would walk through. The first one would walk through. And as he's walking through, he would repeat, what we've done to these animals, if I don't keep my side, will happen to me. <laughs> and everybody said, amen. And the next guy will come through, amen, and he said, listen, what happened to these animals, you know what I'm saying, what happened also to me? And that was it. They knew, amen, that if you break this, there's going to be a consequence. It was just so clear. And Abraham understood, that, amen, that God was going to do something miraculous. 
he gets excited, man. He's cutting the animals. Uh, and the Bible says, oh, vultures come. And he's like, listen, you're not having my blessing. <laughs> listen, he starts beat up the birds. Boop, boop, all day long. Amen. The carcasses is there. You know, the vultures that are coming. And listen, he, he's trying to deal with this. Uh, but the Bible says that as he's doing this, the sun goes down. Um, and the Bible says that God himself starts to come. Now, I don't know if there's any, if there are lights in there. The lights. Can you turn off the lights? Anyone? Special effects. I don't know if I'm be able to but hey. <laughs> the Bible says, listen. Come on. The Bible, oh, you can't see me now, innit? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm here. Boom. <laughs> but you can turn off the light. You can turn off the light. The Bible says, I mean, think about this, it's, it's, it's sacrificed. And the Bible says that God comes down like a, like a, a smoking oven. He comes down, amen, like, a, like lightning. And again, we know that this is, this is how sometimes God makes himself apparent, you know, in Exodus. When um, God was speaking to Moses on the mountain, there was what smoke. There was lightning, fiery manner. We know that the cloud by day, right? And fire by night. This is how God appears. And so the <laughs> so this is how God appears. So think about it. God comes down. I want you to think about this. He comes down and God himself passes through this bloody mess, this aisle, amen, filled with blood. And what God was saying to Abraham, listen, son. This ain't no joke. I promise you that I'm going to keep my promises to you. In other words, if I don't stick to my side of the bargain, what's happened to these animals will happen to me. I don't know if you can turn the light off. That's so what you're seeing is, amen, uh, to be honest with you, uh, you know, I, I have to read between the lines because Abraham knew two parties have to walk. God has done his bit. And it, uh, if I was Abraham, amen, and I know, Abraham would have said, well, I know, God, you're good for it now. But the question is, I don't know about me, Lord. That's the truth, right? Because oftentimes, I mean, we do make, you know, come to the, how many times have we been to the water? But I'll never, ever cuss her out again. <laughs> the next day. <laughs> God, I'll never. Our us will be dead already. Cut up. <laughs> That's the truth. And the, the issue is, I mean, Abraham would have considered, man, I, God, I don't know about me. But the truth of the matter is, uh, what happens is the story just folds up. God walks through and he begins to promise him again. So listen, he said, I'm parasites, Arazites, all the rest of the ites. I'm going to give you from Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates. And he closes up the, the, the deal. Abraham doesn't have to walk in. And the only conclusion is, amen, is that because God is saying, listen, I know you can't fulfill your sight. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sign for you as well. So if you don't keep your sight, I will be killable. I don't know if you can sense the, already in Genesis, the gospel being trying to be ministered here. The gospel, very early in scripture, God knows where he's going, amen. And so the Bible is telling us, because we know, amen, on Calvary, in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, the Bible tells us, amen, that darkness again fell. And the issue is, uh, amen, as God, as, uh, <clears throat> as Jesus, amen, uh, is, 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 is there, and he says, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the truth of the matter is that Jesus, amen, was fulfilling our side of the bargain. So I know you can't do it. 
So I know I've done it for you. And so church, what I'm trying to explain very, very briefly uh, is that, listen, uh, God knows, amen, uh, <clears throat> that we can't, but he can. And so the promises of God are not depending on you. They're not dependent on you. They're all on him. The promise of God relates to his character and who he is. This is why what I was trying to say to you, amen, in, in, um, in, in, in Psalm 3, where David, when he looks back over this, he knew what had gone on. He knew the kind of promise that Jesus, uh, the, uh, that God had made. He didn't fully well understand it how we understand it now. But he says, God's promise, amen, is unchanging. And if we can come to God with a right heart, if I can spread, amen, before God uh, as he did, amen, uh, I know, amen, God will still be for me. God, amen, has promised and he keeps his promises. If you fell, I will take your place. And we know Isaiah 53 verses 8 says amen that he was cut off Christ became our anchor I want to turn to this last passage and we'll pray First Corinthians one twenty. I should have really mentioned this at the beginning. First Corinthians one twenty says, "For all the promises of God, in Him are yes, and in Him are amen, to the glory of God through us." So, to, to me, that makes sense now. You know, Paul is saying that our, our promises are not empty or just believe. What's wrong with you? You, you know, conjure up this kind of, it says, no, 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 you ain't got to conjure up anything. It ain't empty. Because when Jesus died on the cross for us, and then he rose again, what, what, what Paul is saying, when you, when you see Jesus, that is our promise. That, amen, basically Paul, um, what he's getting at is that the very integrity of God has been made public and it's been verified for the risen Savior. All the promise of God are yes and amen in him. And the fact that we have Christ we can walk out this building, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the contradiction, we know the promises of God are yes and amen. They've been paid for. Every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to pray. And my challenge to us it's because David found himself in a situation, as we said this morning, and he turns to the promises. And we know, amen, <clears throat> we know that whole story, how Absalom ended up dead. He wasn't happy about it, but kingdom was very fragile at that time and that whole story but we know that David ends up back on his throne and, I, and sometimes I say God I really want to be able to communicate what you mean in your word that, that people need I need a real deep understanding because it, it just keeps our chin up high, keeps our chest out.
that we can come to the Robot Dallas Church. We can truly come to him, Robot Dallas. He, he loves it because he knows that if you come to me with the right heart concerning your doubts, listen, it, it's transformative. If Abraham or Abram had not come to God with the truth of what's going on in his heart, we'll never see this episode. We'll never see this revelation. Even a Thomas struggled and, and was wrestling and eventually he came. But, he, you know, without his doubts, we would never have seen his side of the story. The promises of God are yes and amen. And what we can do, you know, we can learn to work these things out with him. Because God does sometimes hold back. I mean, years and years he had to wait. He still had to wait after that. We're like, God, how comes? I mean, God is always working. God is always doing something for the greater good. All things work together for good. The bad and the ugly. The good. God makes sure everything works out to His glory. We can trust Him. And what this all call is all about, Amen. It's saying, God, I want to grow in this. God, I want to learn to trust. God, I, I don't trust the politicians. I 